Hey, everybody, and welcome to That Vintage Lens Podcast. We're back again. I'm Brandon Stanley, and I'm here in the studio with Daniel Gebert, Andy Adamas, and John Henry Keenan. And so we're going to be talking today about what cameras we own, what we're hoping to pick up in the future, um, specifically 35 millimeter cameras. We had an episode a couple weeks ago about medium format, so we're jumping back to 35. Um, but first, what we wanted to do is kind of go around and just talk a little bit about what we've done this past week in photography, kind of um, an update for the group here of uh, what we've been out shooting and, and or maybe maybe we haven't shot anything. I don't know. So, Daniel, have you done anything interesting with 35 the past week? Yeah. So I have some Portra 400 loaded up and I've, I've had that in the camera for the last couple rolls. And um, so we were in Philly for a couple of days and we shot just around just some stuff, uh, nothing crazy. And then I shot some family stuff for my brother and my sister-in-law and their kids. So that's always fun. Family stuff is always just a blast. It's just a great excuse to bring out a camera and get some beautiful photographs for mm -hmm. them. And you nice. know, and, and film, especially Portrait 400, it always looks great. So yeah. that's what I've been up to. Well, nice. It was inside or? Uh, some inside stuff in like a, at a park and then some, uh, or I'm sorry, some outside stuff at a park and then some inside stuff too. So. You know, inside a park and yeah, then outside know. in yeah. the family room. It was a big, <laughs> like, yeah, anyway. Nice. Andy, any updates uh, there? Well, it's not 35 millimeter. <sighs> I know, do I get We're off this? topic, man. I'm going to have to strike on. this yeah. from the record. Okay. <laughs> well, well okay. I, 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 yeah, yeah any was, sort of update. I shot um, Cine Still at my son's birthday party in the worst environment you can possibly shoot in. Of course. <laughs> which I looked online. I was like, you know what? I know Cine Still is super finicky. And I, everything it said not to do, I did. Okay. So people are going to come out looking like Smurfs. Okay. I guarantee you. Gotcha. They had red, this red tint on the windows above, and then daylight. Oh. So if there's anybody from Sydney still listening, they're probably like, this guy <laughs> Why is his he money. even on a podcast? Exactly. Yeah. Go wash cars or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'm curious to but, see how it turns out. Yeah. yeah. And I, I still don't know if that film back works on the... <laughs> <laughs> there <laughs> it are, gets even better. There, there are a lot of variables. Yeah. There's a lot of variables and, you know... It's going to be fun. And this is on the, the Mamiya that you've got. Or, sorry, not the Mamiya. I'm sorry. It's Brand. on the Bronica. It it's, Daniel's got the Mamiya. No, the this Bronica. is your Bronica. Okay, the SQAI? SQAI. Nice. And, um, yeah, I love that camera. It's so you, you shot 800T or 50D? Eight, 800T. And, actually, man, I did. I shot uh, some long exposure stuff. Um, nice. With Cinestill? On Saturday. No, no. That, that was uh, uh, Ilford 400 Delta. Nice. Okay. Okay. So we'll see how that goes. And I still don't know if that film back works. <laughs> so this could be all I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. It's fine. Yeah, I'm sure. It, yeah. I'm the sure good news fine. is, if it doesn't work, at least you won't just spend too much money. No. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> it's too late. They already yeah. got my money. There so. you go. So John Henry, any up? I, I know you sent out some stuff this week. Yeah, I'm. I'm excited to see how that turn turns out. It was a big variety of different locations. A few weeks ago, I was with Daniel in Washington shooting mostly like architecture stuff at Georgetown, mm -hmm. and then just a couple nights ago, I was out in Chinatown here in Chicago, and inspired again by Daniel, who I saw some neat pictures uh, that he'd taken there, and I'm interested to see how they turn out because it was on Portra 400, mm -hmm. which is not you know, too fast for shooting mm -hmm. nighttime in mm -hmm. Chinatown. But there was some interesting lights and neon stuff, and they always just have a lot of interesting objects, especially in the stores there yeah. mm -hmm. and things. So I'm hoping that turns out nice. Nice yeah. and vibrant, for sure. I yeah. shot um, some Fuji Superior 800. It was an expired role mm. in Chinatown a couple of months ago. And I was kind of testing out the meter in my camera because I usually use a light meter, but every once in a while I leave it at home or whatever. Um, but so I'll, I have to rely on the in-camera meter mm -hmm. on my Pentax and it got tricked a lot in Chinatown. Yeah. But I will say the Pentax meter, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in a sec, but it's not the most reliable thing in the world. And I know yeah. the Olympus is a much more reliable meter. So I'm curious to see how those turn out. Well, yeah. I'm hoping the meter was a little wrong because if it wasn't, they were definitely underexposed. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this week, yeah. um, I went, I was actually with Daniel. It's funny, like, it's like all roads lead to Daniel this week when talking wow. about films. Wow, all right. So like, yeah. oh, um, Next week it'll be Andy. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dan the man, there's just, there's no rhyme there. 
just <laughs> yeah no no none, none whatsoever andy the um, mandy never. <laughs> <laughs> moving on <laughs> so yeah we were uh we were in philadelphia uh which was great because it's um it's a, a fun city to photograph because it, it not only has the the architecture and the history there but it's mm-hmm. also got um some dilapidation uh, yeah. and so we went to uh we had a little bit of time after we um had our film shoot uh which was we were you know conducting some interviews uh out in i guess the suburbs you would call it mm-hmm. and so we were driving around trying to find some cool places and we actually stumbled upon um an abandoned a partially abandoned graveyard it looks like it's been there for a Mm -hmm. long time there were civil war um uh headstones there Uh, it's called mount mariah uh and it's outside of philadelphia um but yeah they've got some great like these big mausoleums that are that are abandoned that have been bricked up or whatever Mm -hmm. and the the um the woods have kind of been reclaiming the area so Mm. it's you know you've got these headstones in the middle of like this forested area which is just it's really cool to see um and there there are some areas where it looks like they still take care of it but um but it was a great opportunity to um just kind of take some unique portraits and and uh uh, take some some shots in kind of the uh, areas that were falling apart, um, respectfully, of course, uh, sure. to the, to those who are still buried there. Um, and then we also were able to walk around some other areas where there were you know uh, rows of houses that looked very identical. You get some of the uh, uh, um, the patterns going on there. So um, it was a lot of fun. I'm actually looking to send it to send this film off to a new lab. So I've used the dark room for a while. Um, originally I used Robert's camera in Indianapolis, which if you're looking for used cameras, it's a fantastic place to go. Um, and I used them for a while, but once I moved to Chicago, it, they weren't as local. Um, and a lot of the cameras places around here in Chicago still send theirs off. They don't do it in, in right. house. So, it's frustrating. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. So, um, so I've always sent it to the dark room, but, uh, Daniel was mentioning Richard photo lab out in, uh, California as well so um, their stuff looks great uh, and I've made an account there and I think I'm going to send these next few rolls off there they're about five dollars more than the dark room um, but they they've got some uh, some features as you're uh, sending the film off that it seems like they're a little bit more um, in depth so we'll see we'll see I'm curious to see how I did find someone that develops locally yeah it's been developing for since the 70s Mm -hmm. so he's been doing it forever developing Um, and scanning Yes, developing and scanning. What is the turnaround uh, time like? Uh, I think it's probably a week or, or two. I didn't actually... I don't know. There's, I didn't ask. Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> a friend of mine Usually told me, it's weak. Yeah. A friend of mine was telling me about a place that she goes to get her film scanned and developed and all that, but I couldn't find any information on their website. She's like, oh yeah, it's six bucks for a roll, and you just it, sometimes you get your film back, the scans back later yeah. that day, which is... I think it would be ideal mm-hmm. if you're downtown and you can do that, you know, drop it off the lab, run, do some errands and then come back and get it. But I couldn't find any information on their site about what their resolutions were like, what kind yeah. of scanner they're using. And I, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know. Do you remember what the him? place was called? I have it written down somewhere. I, I would have to look it up. It's C C D S. Which town was like it? That. It's in, it's downtown. Okay. Hmm. That definitely sounds like it might be worth one roll if you weren't yeah. Yeah. too, yeah. too nervous about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we're going to jump on to the main tap topic of this podcast uh, today, which is what 35 millimeter cameras are we using? And also, what are we looking to pick up in the future? Um, I have a list longer than my arm of cameras that I want to pick up, but I've got a really down. short arm. I know yeah, it's, it's true. It's a baby arm. It's true. <laughs> it's like, uh, we call him Brandon T- T-Rex around yeah. the yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we've narrowed it down to a, at least like two cameras each um, or, you know, um, just a, a camera in general that we've been looking at, that sort of thing. So. Um, or, you know, maybe we're fine with the camera that we've got. That's also yeah. fine, too. You know, not everyone. What we don't want to promote is that you have to get a ton of new cameras. Right. Yeah. They are cheap. But in the end, you know, if you've got a camera you love, you don't need to get another one. It's true. So um, true. I can start off. Yeah, go for it. I'm going to start off with. What are you shooting? OK, I <laughs> yeah. have pretty much on me 24 seven, a Pentax ME Super. Nice. Uh, with 50 mil 1.7. And I love it. It's it's great. It's bright enough where you are getting a good amount of low light on Mm -hmm. that 50 mil, Um, but it's not 1.4 or 1.2. So uh, on a film in a film SLR, that's full manual. I -hmm. feel like those apertures are pretty much just hopeless for focus unless you have a completely still subject and you're on a tripod. Yeah, 1.8, 2.0 is like where you want to shoot, and you Mm -hmm. can be confident the focus will be good. You know, it's what you're seeing through the viewfinder, but. 
I love this camera. And you were talking about how film doesn't necessarily have the same kind of gear envy syndrome as uh, or, or uh, gear acquisition syndrome as sure. digital. And I really don't, I don't really want another camera sure. right now. And in terms of like things that I would actually get, I don't think I actually want anything. Mm-hmm. But if yeah, we're talking, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I was just going to say, because we were talking um, earlier about how like with, with digital, a new camera comes out and it's like, oh, it's got a better sensor. It's yeah. better at this, better in low light, better dynamic range, that sort of thing. None of that's the same with film. Like you get a yeah. new camera, not because... Um, not because it's going to be, you know, that much better in, in photo quality. I mean, maybe right. you do sometimes, but um, possibly. But it's not like they're releasing new cameras all the time where uh, that's the case. Usually, uh, it just comes down to the film itself and the lens. Right. And as long as you've got, you know, good film and you have a good lens, you can't really improve that much. Yeah. In terms of photo quality. Now, yeah. sure, if you're looking for something that has autofocus or you're looking for something that has a better, you know, a different uh, set of lenses, then that's one thing. Yeah. Um, but it's not the same as like, oh, a new one's out and it's 10 times better. It's yeah. just not the case. Exactly. Um, and especially because it's all manual. Yes, like I was saying, there's a light meter built in, but it's it's not super reliable. Um so yeah, I, I don't really desire to shoot on anything different right now. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, and I hope everyone caught the sound of Andy's camera taking a <laughs> photo of yeah. of the the group here. We got everyone, <laughs> everyone's like, I, I bet you I can guess what that camera is. <laughs> I know that shot. We'll sound. get to it. I want to hear. Yeah. Um, so, but that being said, cameras I would like to pick up. But that's all you carry, though. I see another camera. Oh, there's a the, my Mamiya, oh, which we talked that. about last week. Is a Mamiya. We're, we're forbidden to talk about that. M six four five one thousand S. It's a great medium format camera. Anyway, Moving the thirty five is a, yeah a Pentax ME Super. It's a really tiny little compact camera. Basically, if you're familiar with the Pentax K one thousand, it's virtually the same in terms of features and specs and all that kind of stuff. But it's a little bit smaller body. It's I like it for its compactness. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I would love to have. You're talking about cameras with features. I would love to have an autofocus Canon EOS something. Sure. Elan, whatever. Oh, or, uh, stop. You brought up the Elan 7 earlier Shh. today. We'll get to it. But <laughs> I'm not jumping the gun. I apologize. Um, so something, something along those lines, sure. like a, um, an EOS 1V, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But at the same time, if I want an automated camera, I'll probably just pick up a 5D. Sure. The dream camera mm-hmm. is, I mean... I'm probably not unique in this, but I think a Leica M7. Sure. Or an M6, mm-hmm. or an M3, or an M2. Mm-hmm. A Leica M of some sort. I would be thrilled to to just experience one of those for a week or so. Mm-hmm. Just to, I yeah. love the rangefinder, uh, the Feel. mentality yeah, of it. Like, yeah, uh, yeah the, the experience of shooting on a rangefinder is really unique. Mm-hmm. And I would love to have a Leica at some point, but, sure, you know. You're a rangefinder guy. I like rangefinders. Yeah, because you typically shoot with when you're shooting digital, um, for fun, not for work. But mm-hmm. you usually shoot on what the the Fuji. What is it? X X one hundred T. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Which yeah, I adore that camera. Yeah. It's not, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not a true rangefinder. It gives sure. you kind of the feeling of a rangefinder. But yeah. focusing on a rangefinder, I've always found like a real film rangefinder mm-hmm. is just really fun. It's snappy. Um, looking through like not looking through a prism is mm-hmm. kind of a fun experience. Yeah. Um, I still don't understand yeah. it. That's just my brain, though. Yeah, it, it's different. It's very different. It's like what if, if what I'm looking at is that what I'm is that what I'm going to develop? No, not quite. See, yeah, yeah. it's a little bit off. Yeah, that's it's okay. a little bit off. It's a fun experience though because it's it's uh it's I don't know. Part of the whole fun of film is that you don't immediately know what you're getting. Yeah, yeah, but then you really don't know what you're getting. You, you yeah. mostly know what you're you getting. <laughs> you're if getting you, exactly what yeah. you saw. It's, if you, you shoot know, with shift one, it over. Yeah. I imagine if you when I, here here's the thing when I get my Leica M6 sure. in like two weeks, <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll give it to you and you can just mess around with oh, it. You just for, give it to me. Right? Yeah, yeah, for a, for a, for like a week. A week you sure. can mess with it. Really? No. Yeah. You would trust I, me? I think absolutely. I think that if you shot with one for a bit, you would get confident in in what. It's a what possibility. So what what appeals to you about that camera? The Leica or the yeah the Leica, the Leica the um, Leica. Yeah, the the, the craftsmanship, mm-hmm. the timelessness of it. Yeah. In the same way that my Pentax, which is decades old, and my Mamiya, my, uh, I'm sorry, my Mamiya, which is decades old, mm-hmm. they still are just these beautiful pieces of of machinery. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Leica, pretty much the pinnacle of that 
of that whole era. I'm you know, not familiar with. Is that the one that patina is really nice? Leicas? A lot yeah. of them do. Because I saw someone posted the, the, the finish on the, the Leicas. Some of the mm-hmm. older ones were. They've got like the brass. Yeah, well, they yeah. Br- yeah, so they weren't. They no one wanted the black ones, I guess, or something like that. Um, and then I don't know. now the black, the vintage black ones are the ones that people want to go after. Right. Typically, with with thirty five millimeter cameras, the black cameras were, um, like the professionals typically wanted the black cameras, and they were usually more expensive, as far as I know. There was usually like a, uh, like a, uh, there was usually a bit of a premium on the the black cameras so like nikon had silver cameras and they had black ones of the same model and usually it was like 50 to 100 bucks well oh, wow. not, maybe not 100 bucks but like you know 50 That's bucks more or something like that for the black yeah, um i don't know right. exactly why they rationalized that but it's also um i'm sure for for professional cameras it was a little sleeker it was a little bit uh more discreet um, for yeah. photojournalists yeah, yeah or more, whatever. more discreet for sure yeah. um so but for sure now the black leicas are very highly sought after because they they get that really tremendous looking yeah. brass patina. That mm-hmm. is really nice. Yeah, that is really nice. Yeah, but they they also made a couple Leicas that weren't fully brass, mm-hmm. and so those ones are really easy to pick up now, or much easier. Yeah, I'm talking about a few thousand as opposed to like many thousand dollars. Yeah. So like, what does an M7 run at this point? Ooh, I you know I honestly haven't looked at M7s because yeah. they're too expensive. But an M6, <laughs> yeah, an M6 between two and three for like a really good a good for, one. Yeah, something yeah. that's so, near something mid- that I would actually trust right i feel like um, you can get them for like i don't know i've seen some for under a grand they're not in fantastic shape yeah that's the problem there um and most likely you know, i find that german cameras can be like german cars and that they are very reliable but they take maintenance yeah um and so i know a lot of the the leicas um they have to be sent back to germany or to a uh service center somewhere here in the states at the very least to get the rangefinder re yep. readjusted because over time that'll kind of um your your focus will be blown a bit if, mm-hmm. if it's not so i th- yeah. my general rule of thumb when picking up cameras i try to get them in mint condition because yeah. you know we're talking cameras here that are at minimum usually like 20 years old yeah um I mean, it is 2019. Most film cameras stopped being released in the early 2000s. Yeah, that's um, the very latest. Yeah, and so the ones we're talking about are usually 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and so with something that old, I want something that's in mint condition because I know it hasn't been banged up and yeah. and neglected for that time. I know that someone yeah. has either forgotten it in a closet or they've really babied it, which is is what I want to see because I know that right. it'll probably last me longer too. Right. Um, I tend to have a a connection with my cameras after a while, like um, my F3, which I'll talk on in a bit. I've taken that to like four different countries outside the states, and, and it's it's become the camera. No, more than that, but so it's become the camera that I travel with because I like to be able to say, oh yeah, this camera's been to this many countries. It's traveled all over the world with me. Yeah. Um, and similar with some of my other cameras too, like I I form that bond, so I want them to last a long time i don't right. want to have to replace them and it is special when you can find a camera that's basically brand new even though it was made 50 years ago yeah, yeah. That, that is, is really nice i got i you and i both had good luck with camera purchases recently that mm-hmm. we got our cameras and they were in really good shape you got lucky i got very heck. very lucky <laughs> <laughs> that mamiya that you've got which for mint condition usually usually runs like six seven hundred bucks yeah with the lens with the lens say, with the with, 80 mil 1.9 exactly with that lens which is fairly rare usually runs pretty expensive and you took a chance on one that was what 350 bucks yeah and it comes in and it's it's like near mint like yeah. almost unused hey daniel yeah. you think you should still keep it the mamiya yeah i think yeah i think i guess it's okay it's whatever <laughs> yeah. no and you're talking about relationships with cameras and um i feel that way about cars in the same in a similar way but mm-hmm. i've definitely developed a relationship with my film cameras because you especially the ones that are fully manual you, mm-hmm. you have to you know it's it constantly reminds you that it's an image creation process mm-hmm. yeah it's not an image taking process yeah and um yeah that's just yeah well and you pick up something like a leica uh yeah. m6 or m7 you, there's a high likelihood you're going to pass that down to your kids or your yeah. grandkids or something like that's that so i mean awesome. they last so long and it becomes the type of thing that you can pass on like a fine mm-hmm. watch uh, yeah. Which I don't. I mean, you can say the same, I guess, about digital, but yeah. I can't really see. Like, there, there are so many things about digital that after a while you can't find. Whether it's the batteries, or whether the sensor burns out, yeah, or memory whether, cards. And even yeah. then, I don't think they have the same character in that uh, 
a 5D Mark I was at the top of the market at one point, right. but I don't see anyone passing that particular camera no. down to his, his kid because <laughs> it's at like one time it was the best. Yeah. 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 But whereas these older mechanical cameras not only have quality that's enduring, but I think they have a more human element yeah. in terms mm-hmm. of the, like Daniel said, the image creation, mm-hmm. which is worth saving and holding on to. For yeah. sure. So anything more than the M7 here? Or the- what's, what's your accessory? What's Oh, your- accessory? Come back to me on that. We'll do cameras <laughs> first, and then I'll do cameras. accessory. Okay. Okay, we'll do cameras. Good. You started on the F3. Why don't you keep going? Sure. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the F3. So the camera that I carry with me all the time, and I'll, I'll rattle through a couple things here, too, just so people know how my process works. So I, I have different cameras for different films um, because they're cheap enough I can do that. Yeah. So I have um, a, a Nikon F2 that always has high-speed black and white. Um I have uh, a Nikon 28 Ti, which I use for like consumer film. It's a point and shoot camera. Um, and I keep that around the house as like, oh, you know, I want something with autofocus that's really tiny. Um, or I just want to walk outside and have something really small on me. Um, I shoot with a uh, Canon 1V when I want to shoot with like L series lenses or something, something larger. Um, uh, or rather something that I can get like really shallowed up the field that has autofocus. So like mm-hmm. if I'm working and I want something that I can swap lenses between a 5D, I shoot that. Right. And then I shoot low speed black and white film in a Kodak, um, an old German Kodak. Um, and so it's like a, a range finder. I love it. It's, it's so tiny and compact. Um, and then... Um, my daily carry camera, the one that I take everywhere, is an Nikon F3 that I've always got like 400 mm-hmm. speed film in. Um, it's like my general go-to camera, the one that travels everywhere with me. And what I really love about it, it's it's like the most robust camera um, I've worked with aside from maybe a Leica. But it's it's so sturdy and well built. Um, I mean, just to, to give you an idea for how sturdy this thing is i was filming or i was shooting film downtown you know uh probably six months ago at this point and uh i was about to cross the street and this car pulled out you know they, they didn't see that someone was trying to cross and the guy I, so i stopped the guy behind me didn't and he ran into me hard enough that it knocked the camera out of my hand because i i had just taken the shoulder strap off because i and mm. you know i don't know why you made it's, it you just made it sound like you got hit by a car though just no so. i didn't get hit by a car <laughs> the camera got hit by a car almost and then a yeah. truck there we go yeah but no it the guy hit me hard enough from behind he was looking at his phone or something and it knocked the camera out of my hand the camera hit the concrete downtown from over waist level i had it almost up to my eye wow. it hit the concrete and I was like, that's it. It's done for. I've had yeah. this camera. This was my first film camera ever, and now it's gone. Now Everything it's- was in slow motion. Exactly. And so I picked it up, and the lens itself was just completely dead. It was a Nikon 50 1.8. Um, so not a crazy expensive lens. In fact, um, the cheapest lens. About the cheapest Nikon lens you yeah. can How get much for is that a prime. Lens? You can pick them up for fifty bucks. Okay. So it's yeah. a great lens. It's a pancake. Super small. Super small. Um, but that was the only thing that was broken. Like it wow. dented a little bit of the viewfinder mm-hmm. on the front on the camera, um, and so I ended up replacing that because I could hear yeah, like some you rattling. Can take those yeah, they're off. replaceable. Yeah. Um, and so I picked one up on eBay, fairly cheap. I've still got the old one sitting downstairs as a backup, but the camera functions perfectly. Only thing that's residual from that, from hitting the concrete, is that the the film counter sometimes sticks. So mm-hmm. sometimes it'll hmm. tell me that I'm starting on you know shot three instead of shot one. Um, wow. So super robust. Um, big bright viewfinder. You can switch out the focusing screens. Um, and yeah, it's got when a- you showed show that to me the other day when you took the top off, mm-hmm. it you- reminded me just. Here we go again. Reminded me of a medium format. Yeah, because you can just like the waist level. Right. Viewfinder. Yeah, you can get a waist level viewfinder for it. It's um, dope. And that is really sweet. That's a nice. It's pretty unique it- among SLRs too. Am I right? Yeah, I mean a lot of the Nikon's, some of the pro level stuff you could. <laughs> some of the pro level stuff you could switch stuff out on so is it easy to see when it's down at your waist um because it's a bit it's, it's smaller pretty small than medium format i wouldn't recommend it oh that yeah much. yeah like you can but show I, them I, I mean, yeah like i can it focus right on it if you want, want to take a look and they make like a specific waist level viewfinder there but that's nice have you ever used it much for street photography not really um well not not the waist level viewfinder at least and what lens do you have on there right now right now i've got uh, the 35 millimeter 
um, AI lens. It's not AIS, it's just an AI lens. It's an F2 lens. Uh, so this setup right here was actually, this was the first film camera that I ever bought. Um, and it was the first lens that I bought with it too. And I, I picked up the camera for like 200 bucks, picked up the lens for like 70, mm -hmm. picked them up at Robert's camera in uh, Indianapolis. And um, and I have to give a shout out to, to uh, my buddy, Tim Porter, because um, the reason I picked up the camera, he, he's always been in the film and he had an F3 for a little while. Don't know if he still has it or not, but uh, he showed me and it was like instant love. I, like I saw this thing and it was like that, that's the camera. That's yeah, the one it feels that I need great, to get. man. Yeah, it really does. Um, and so, yeah, it's a good balance. It's got, um, I almost said it has autofocus. It doesn't have autofocus, <laughs> but it does have um, aperture priority, which I love because a lot of times when I'm traveling, like I can switch it into full manual mode, but I like the ability to switch it on an aperture priority if I'm in a hurry, if I'm on a film set or something and I need to take a, a photo really quickly. Yeah. Um, some One of those situations where you just don't have time. Right. Um, and so it's it offers a little bit of everything. Um my main issues with it, if I had an issue, would just be the fact that the meter is very heavily center weighted. A lot of meters are like 60% 60, 60 from the center dot and 40% from the, the rest of the... Or no, it's the other way around, sorry. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to skip that because I can't remember <laughs> exactly all the details there. Anyway, it's, okay. um, it's very heavily center weighted compared to a lot of other cameras. And so... Uh, there's more of a tendency for the exposure to be off just a little bit yeah. if there's a huge difference between the center, that center point of the frame and the rest of it. Mm. Uh, so like if I'm taking a picture with a guy in a black shirt that's dead center, or if I'm taking a picture where the sun is directly in the center, that'll throw it off quite a bit. Um, but Back, yeah, it's compact. scenes and stuff like exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. But it's compact. It has access to great Nikon lenses. And um, yeah, it's just a joy to carry around with me. Do you ever just throw on like a modern nikon 70 to 200 and just have fun with it well so you can't use some of the modern lenses the ones that don't have um an adjustable aperture the on AI. them oh on the or, like an external adjustable aperture the ones where uh like for the the ones that we have for the d810 at work mm -hmm. um you adjust the aperture on the camera not on the lens and they don't work well on these because it will only take it at the minimum or the the uh, closed down aperture. Uh, so like if it's an f22, if it's like an f2.8 to 22 lens, it'll take the photo all the time at f22. So unless okay. you're shooting like yeah. on the surface of the sun, it's going to be a little bit underexposed. Yeah, or I mean, maybe you're metering for f22, but that's all you can do. Yeah. So you Man, really have to pick shit. up um, one of the Nikon's that that you can that has the actual aperture wheel on right. the camera right um, gotcha 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 so that limits a little bit of the modern lenses that you can use you right. can't use any of like their best lenses these days yeah um but i do have the two lenses that i have for it right now i've got the uh Ni nikon 85 1.4 ais um and actually i have uh, tomorrow it's coming in the 35 1.4 no. ais mm. so i i'm I Sneaky. am not going to retire the 35 F2, but there have definitely been more times lately when I'm filming or taking pictures on a film set when it's a little bit too dark for F2. So um, it's happened like once or twice. Hey Brandon, how much does that uh, 35 mil F1.4 run for these days? The one that I picked up was about 400. Okay. So it's not crazy. It's not, it it's not crazy. Right. But um, yeah, it's it's. I like having a 35-85 combo. Yeah. It's kind of my favorite one. So, so yeah, that's what I shoot with. And then uh, what I'm looking to pick up, I was trying to find, I, I've got, like I said, a list that's pretty long, and I was trying to figure out a camera that I want that other people wouldn't have or wouldn't be talking about, rather. Um, and so my, my camera of choice, the one that I want to pick up, is um, a Wide Lux F8. Oh, yeah. And so, what? yeah, for, okay. for people who don't know, it's mm. a panoramic camera where the lens on the front, um, it's kind of hard to explain, but it essentially rotates around the front. There's like a shutter that rotates around the front. And so you get um, you get pictures that are, if I remember correctly, they're about three 35 millimeter slides wide. Wow. And so um, you get these great, just like huge panoramic shots. Mm -hmm. And really the reason that that's on my list is because I want an X-Pan, the Hasselblad X-Pan. Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> but they're also thirty five hundred dollars if you're looking oh, for one in decent mm -hmm. shape. Yeah. Sometimes it's it's thirty five hundred for one that's just okay and it still has scratches and it's beat up. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want something that's panoramic that doesn't cost that much. And how much? The F eight 
Uh, that one's the most recent one, and that one will run you for mint condition somewhere in the eleven hundred dollar range. So still okay. not cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, in it, it's funny. So definitely, you beginners out there, that's a great first camera. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, oh, maybe no, no, it's not. <laughs> I will say, like one of the, some of the issues are that based on just how wide it is. Um, there's a there's a lot of distortion if you don't do it properly. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. um, so if you've got something that's too close, it'll be very distorted. So yep. it has to be, like if you're going to take good panoramic shots, the objects need to be a little ways away. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it, it's like like iPhone photos. You know, when you take a panorama on your iPhone, sometimes they just look really distorted, and, and it's maybe that's what you're going for. Mm-hmm. But if you're not. You have to just be yeah. careful. But. What's the field of view on that? It's nearly 180, isn't it? 180 I don't know. I haven't. I, I it's, haven't. It's very wide. It I bet is, you guys very I'd wide. be curious just some mechanics like uh, how it might affect how steady you have to hold the camera while you take it. I'm still trying to, yeah. no pun intended, wrap my mind around <laughs> sure. yeah. but what you described as like the rotating yeah, shutter. well, I would but, I would recommend looking it up. It's a cool looking camera. Yeah. Very unique. Looking. Yeah, <laughs> almost yeah. unrecognizable as a it camera. It looks like a. Right? like a tank turret in the front. it, it, it kind just, of does yeah, yeah that's, exactly. that, that's probably the best way i would explain it is it looks like an old old like german tank turret yeah um but jeff bridges would know right exactly. so that was that's what i was going to mention so it's interesting because i guess jeff bridges is known for shooting wide luxes i didn't even know the that weird. he was known for photography that much mm-hmm. but yeah he's he's been like the dude. One of their, the dude he's been their ambassador in some ways i guess and is just really known for it he's gotten like some photography awards for his wide lux shots so um i guess he did it some on some of his movie sets and hmm. uh, yeah so it's interesting that's cool yeah but yeah so cool I, to I see figured, those yeah yeah for sure um, so yeah, that's kind of the, uh, one of the cameras that I've been looking at, uh, yeah. cause really at this point, I don't need any more cameras. I yeah. really don't. I feel that but, way. And I only have like, yeah. three. I, I feel like Brandon doesn't need any more cameras. <laughs> you <laughs> feel like Brandon's yeah. wife thinks he doesn't need any more <laughs> yes, cameras. Although, sure. spe- speaking of Brandon's cameras and this, this wide thing, right before you came in, Brandon, yeah, we were all wondering about your camera in the corner there with the, oh, the dual lenses. The yeah. Dual lenses. That is for taking 3D images. Really? Yeah, that's what Daniel film. thought. Uh huh. So you focus one, it'll focus both lenses simultaneously. Is that what they shot Avatar on? Yeah, that, that camera. <laughs> frame right by there. frame. Yeah. I could see that. One, one frame, frame at a time. time. But yeah, so you remember, I don't know what they're called, but remember like the, the things that you used to look through as a kid where you'd flip through and it would yeah. bring the images around oh, on like a yeah, disc? Yeah, something light. No, yeah, no, no, and they no, looked no, light. 3D. Well, that's neat because I mean, there's a big cool. history of those like in the development of motion pictures, yeah. especially. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, the lenses back. are about the distance of two eyes. So it's um, you combine those images in the right way, and it it does look three D. So it's um, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was wow. your accessory? Oh, accessory that I'm looking to pick up. I don't know. Um, that's tough at this point because I I I'm trying to stay minimal right now with everything mm-hmm. and not pick up too much stuff. I, I mean, I, I like having, he says, as he just picked up two yes. vintage Nikon lenses. Hey now. Okay. <laughs> yes. But like, those are, I guess those are accessories. I consider those more like part of the camera, but, sure, sure, sure. um, yeah, I, I am kind of interested in picking up some more lenses. Um, I've looked at like the, the, you can't use them on the Nikons, but the M42 mount lenses, yeah. like the, the Pentax. Yep mount um they're like the super takamars were, were great lenses and um and yeah they're and they're dirt cheap now yep so you can pick up you know mint condition 85 or 35 for like 180 bucks yeah. if not less so screw mount just scares everybody away yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. certainly there are certain aspects that aren't as great as you know a bayonet mount like we have nowadays sure. but um they're also very versatile. The great thing about medium format becoming, or not medium format, I apologize, about mirrorless <laughs> yeah. becoming so prevalent now is that all these old lenses are being, you can use them on so many cameras. Yeah. Suddenly, these M42 mount lenses, you can put them on Canons, you can put them on you know, newer Nikons, mm-hmm. you can put them on... Have you tried any of that yet on your EOS R? I haven't tried too much. I've done um, a couple... Like I've put some older, I put one screw mount on. Um, it's just funny though because now you're doubling up so many like different adapters. Yeah. Um, unless you buy the specific adapter, because I went M42 to EF and then EF to the RF mount, <laughs> and so it was like you you just start adding them up. Was it a Helios? Um, yeah, it was one of the Helios ones yeah. we have at the office. So, 
Um, it's a dope lens. Those are fun lenses. Yes. Yeah. Kids, if you want a fun lens and you don't want to spend a lot of money. Andy, why do you always dress the, address the kids? The kids. The kids, the kids listening. Hey, man. It's always, hey, kids. I might. It's the father in him. I might be the <laughs> eldest of, of the four here. But only might. But might. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what, what about you guys? Andy, wait, wait, have, did we get an accessory? Uh, I mean, I talked about, uh, those were kind of the accessories I was talking some, about. The, some, the, fun, the, some fun lenses so on that. Yeah. Yeah. That Way other thing much. there, it's the Viewmaster. Oh, the Viewmaster. Viewmaster. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's what I was trying Remember to explain that. to you we guys had those, earlier. I, I think I might have had one of those when I was a kid. Those are awesome. Mm, yeah. I feel like everyone had one of those. Yeah, yeah they or weren't least, right along with like the um, toy carpets that you'd roll your truck on. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was thinking light bright. I'm like, that's way off. Well, no, <laughs> not, I mean, you know, I'm saying he's the eldest, but Andy doesn't feel this. Didn't have the childhood memories of the nineties that the rest no. of us might have. <laughs> nope. I yeah. barely have childhood memories from the nineties. The nineties. That's right. We were talking about the nineties. Someone was like, Oh, I remember this song. It's from the, the nineties. I'm like, I was like in high school. Yeah. <laughs> I was in junior high. Yeah. No, I was. No, you were a, four when the no, nineties ended. No, that's what, got, that's what the person said in the office. Oh. Anyway. Uh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I carry the Canon AE one. Uh huh. Um, Great before, camera. Yeah, it's it's awesome. The one thing I do wish it had was aperture priority Dude, or that's some sort of priority. Anything yes. priority? Because right now it's it's because this is the AE one, not the AE one program, program yeah. right? Okay. Which is, it does make a difference. Yeah. So. It, it, it Shooting on this uh, camera, I've shot on this the most. Before, it was the, the Molta, Minolta SR1, mm-hmm. I think it is. That was my grandfather's camera. Um, that was a beast to shoot on, too. So I decided, let's uh, up the ante here. Nice. My cousin gave me this camera. It's been awesome. Um, if you want to get down to the basics and really force yourself to understand what your shutter speed is or what shutter is and uh selecting your aperture and what you should do this kind of forces you to take baby steps sure mm-hmm. so now i i can see why you guys have chosen the cameras you've chosen even you john henry you got a, a even great, me even, even <laughs> you you got a what's your uh, it's uh, an olympus om2s and you have aperture priority yeah and and, and it has, and, and it has a program which I'm still feeling out, I'm which a is awesome. Suspicious of it. It sure. makes sense after shooting on this. I'm like, man, I've I'm missing that. Yeah. So yeah. it's Canon, been great. What is what is it with those older Canon 35 millimeter cameras that they didn't ever do aperture priority? I don't know. One of the cameras that I wish I could love is the the Canonettes. Oh, and yeah. they don't have aperture priority. I thought you have, did love those. I do love them. Yes. I don't love them enough. Yeah. Sure. Like I can't ever love them enough because I just don't. If I ever shoot auto. I feel like two months ago you said something along the lines of, I love this camera enough and so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, These are all lies. If I'm shooting it full manual, which again, I do most of the time, but because yeah. that camera is so small and light, it kind of makes you want to be able to shoot it in some sort of program, some sort of mm-hmm. auto mode. Yeah. yeah. Um, but every time I pick it up and I get me shooting, it just it, throws me that I, I have a, sh- you know, shutter priority. Just, it doesn't really make sense to me. So the, uh, someone, I don't know for the video I saw, but they were, they were saying like one of the biggest differences between someone that is seasoned and is not seasoned is, um, you know, where your aperture's at. You don't have to look down after you understand what your camera is saying, what you should set it to. You should just, by keeping your eye uh, on the viewfinder, you should just know and just click, really? click right to it. Interesting. Interesting. Boom, right to it. Give the mic some of that good aperture yeah. sound right yeah. there. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very satisfying yeah, sound. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been cool. I got the little cheapy 50 FD lens on here, so. 1.8, tried and true. If I drop it in the toilet, it doesn't matter. I don't know why I would drop it in the toilet. The toilet. <laughs> uh, you got to practice somewhere. It's happened before. <laughs> so, yeah, which uh, leads me to what I would like to purchase. Yeah. Um, although I just picked up that Bronica. It's expensive as it is. Uh, I would like to get the Elon 7 or the EOS 3 or even with the EOS 1N. Yeah, the right? 1N. Uh-huh. Those are all great options just because I have... Uh, you know, I have a couple Sigma lenses, art lenses at home. The EF I'd, mount ones? Yeah. Nice. I'd like to put my 50 mil on one of those and just go to town. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And I just know, in you know, the Sigma lenses, if you're not familiar with them, they're really sharp. Uh, and if you're shooting on an FD lens, 
Yeah. It is a night, night and day. Different. Yeah. Because uh, if you're not familiar with this lens, if from my experience, do not go below a 2.8 because it is going to be soft like pudding. So, hmm. yeah. Uh, the Elon 7 and uh, I don't know there's so many Canon well that's uh, cameras out there yeah that that have uh, like the EF mount and auto yeah the EF auto stuff. yeah well it's funny because I feel like the Canon cameras that have autofocus um, and and especially a lot of the autofocus 35 millimeter cameras from Minolta or uh, some of the others they get overlooked so much because people the people who are shooting film these days, typically go toward cameras more like you know the, the old mechanical cameras mm-hmm. not ones that have modern features because if they're going to do that then they'll go toward um you know something that's digital uh which is totally understandable but at the mm-hmm. same time you can pick up these cameras that use modern lenses um and still shoot film uh for those days when maybe you you know need autofocus um i say need you know, i i don't there are times when you need autofocus yeah, I, like I, I think I'm pretty fast at manual focus, but when I'm trying to get sharp focus on a toddler running around, oh, yeah. that's just, you know, it's it takes a lot of work, and sometimes I just want to know that I'm getting it pretty darn close. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can pick those cameras up super cheap. Yeah, I mean, the 1N, we just picked up three of those for the office, mm-hmm. um, and we paid 200 bucks uh, and nothing more than 230 for mint condition EOS one ends. Yeah. Um, and that was a professional camera yeah. in its day, which I guess was like mid nineties to late nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 250 bucks That's at most kind of the going rate yeah. for the majority of those cameras mm-hmm. the one v is the, the most one v expensive. that's when you jump up yeah because that's got the magnesium body it's yeah. got the the heavier like the, the weather ceiling that's more modern and all of that and those mm-hmm. but still those run for you know five to, to seven hundred yeah. for mint condition so it's yeah yeah for especially for shooting that's the one thing it's like there's there is reasoning behind buying wanting to buy that camera it's not just so i can have another one yeah although it is nice uh but like you're saying family mm-hmm. family stuff is great when you're at a party yeah you don't want to be just like oh focus 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 yeah because it's hard to especially with the, the split focus does help on these cameras but i don't know well people have gotten so far away from that time that people get used to pictures taking no time mm-hmm. yeah. we get used to oh i've got my iphone it's got auto meter auto focus and and the composition is really easy so boom i've got a picture right. yeah i found so, that with if you want to take a picture of someone it it's uh just a little awkward sometimes to yeah. be like yeah. hang on give me 35 seconds yeah, sure. you know, yeah. to line this up and yeah. Yeah. let me make and sure then focus right yeah. right and the, the the caveat or i don't know if that's the right way to put sure. it but it's either you have a long lens so you're kind of sniping people out in a distance <laughs> or you have something that's autofocus yeah and you're just like boom in and out just like I th- it makes sense for like street photography i'd love to get more into street photography and i'm not going to be sitting in the street trying to f- if i see something that is captivating that is moving or or you know a person whatever it is i mm-hmm. want to just be able to get that shot yeah, yeah. just so. looking at zone focus zone the focus. zone you familiar with this brand mm-hmm. the zone it's like a street photography thing i've only ever experimented with it on my Fuji. Um, so I haven't done it on film. But is it a technique? Yeah, so it's it basically it's stopping down to 5.6 or gotcha. f8, shooting with a higher right. speed film. You shoot on HP5 and then push it to 16 mm-hmm. so you can get the speed and the shutter speeds and everything right. And then you just set it to like a certain amount of feet, like three feet to seven feet. And then you only shoot things that fall into that that Makes field sense. Mm-hmm. Um, if Smart. it's a person or whatever and then if obviously if you see something across the street then you take the time and you fo- re- still gonna buy that camera but, uh, I, one thing <laughs> no go i mean absolutely it, it's it's hard to <laughs> no that's of, smart i didn't even think about that yeah man. a lot of yeah. times look, what i'll do uh, yeah there's uh, photographers who have like written extensively and, and experimented yeah. with it zone so focusing zone focusing yeah mm-hmm. all right yeah. i got my homework I mean, on a small scale, I do that sometimes with just the fact that I can throw one of these lenses in 5.6 or f8 and throw it into infinity. And yeah. because there are hard stops, which is great on these lenses, mm-hmm. these these old mechanical lenses, um, I know that as long as I'm over, I don't know, 30 feet away from the subject, it's probably going to be pretty close and focused. Oh, yeah. Like, you're, yeah. you know, it's you're not really going to notice if it's a little bit out, um, especially at, f- at 5.6 or f8. So... Yeah. Um, I don't tend to do closer ones than that 
frequently, but every now and then if I if there's a shot that I really want to get and I'm like, if I pull my camera up and take a minute to focus here, I'm going to lose that. Yeah, yeah. Then that's when I'll try and, you That's know, when you break out the old a bit. iPhone. <laughs> no. Heresy. <laughs> we don't say that word. Heresy. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know who that guy was. Yeah, He's I don't know. There. So, yeah. Uh, and then... The accessory uh, is a boring, yet makes complete sense to me, ball head or some sort okay. of geared head yeah. for photography, which yeah. did not make sense to me back in the day. I was like, oh, you just need a fluid head. Yeah. For well, because we're all in video. For yeah. Everything. So it's, yeah. Coming nope. from the cinema world, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No. Well, it kind of, well, it, it does come from the cinema world, I, or at least they used to and mm-hmm. still do use some of those geared heads. Yeah. It's with the little wheelie thingies. Sure. Yeah. High, high, like high the big, productions. Yeah. The big O'Connor heads. And, yeah, there you go. Yeah, but yeah, that's what I want to get. It yeah. just nice. I know a lot of photographers that basically shoot exclusively on a tripod, and that's not typically how I like to shoot. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes yeah. yes, mm-hmm. you need the extra the extra shutter speed and all that kind of and stuff. It's, so it's nice, but one thing that I yeah. dislike, I I think that a tripod is definitely necessary for some things. Mm-hmm. I you mentioned photographers that only shoot on a tripod. I think it comes from composing videos, composing film, like motion film, mm-hmm. um, that I try and make sure that there is variation in my shots. And you mm-hmm. can do that on a tripod, but I yeah. think the the issue with a tripod sometimes, and I'm not dissing tripods, but you're dissing people, tripods. I'm, they have hurt sure. feelings now, Brian. Right, I know. I'm go. But you can get into a habit of shooting of like you have a typical height for yeah. everything. And sometimes you just you need to drop it down or you need to, you mm-hmm. know, go higher or something mm-hmm. like that. And so I use a tripod when I need to, but otherwise I like the fact that I can, you know, I can adjust my yeah. height, yeah. you know, with my body rather than... Ju- yeah, in a split second, you can make a decision. You know what? I want it to be six inches lower or higher yep. on a tripod. That might take you 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. It's not meant to be fast. That's right. for sure. Yeah. But that's an awesome That's an awesome thing. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see what you make. With yeah. I w- so I took the uh, ball head out uh, from the Manfrotto at work. Uh-huh. And it's not... It's more difficult to use than a geared head. Yeah. Yeah. And just in the sense is like you're just kind of you're finagling it's too, it's it too way. fluid. It's yeah. too it's too more it's too much. Or more, did yeah. you have the Bronica on it or did, it's that's the whole point is the yeah. Bronica. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it makes sense you'd want that especially getting into some of the long exposure stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's necessary. Camera's what you can't shoot heavy too. You can't shoot thirty second exposures handheld. I can not, not yet. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. One of these days. A master. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's the benefit of the geared head. Is especially the ones that have the quick release yeah. on them, uh, the quick release knobs, is that you you can make those micro adjustments. If it you're like, you know what, difference. I like this shot, but I want to show, you know, a centimeter more headroom. Mm-hmm. You can do that. Whereas, good it, luck with a ball head trying yeah, to make tiny it, adjustments like that. Yeah, there's uh, someone that I follow that that's all he uses is a ball head, and his shots are amazing. And I don't understand. He must be there for. A while or mm-hmm. just know how to use the ball head better is probably a little bit of both mm-hmm. Interesting. so yeah nice Alrighty then so john henry what are you shooting with currently well like i mentioned so the one camera i've got right now is the olympus om 2s okay i always have to remember the that order S. all those, the last, those yeah. last characters and i've been liking it a ton so far uh i'm definitely the newest here to the film photography world sure so I've only had one full roll exposed so far, and now I've got some more. <laughs> so and more going to the shop. Yeah. So one that you've seen. Yeah, one you, that I've seen. Yeah, but the others uh-huh. are going off. And yeah. that first roll was great. I loved the shots that came out of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm excited to see this because, you know, there's always, did I get this shot or that shot? Like mm-hmm. with Daniel and Washington, there are all these government helicopters going overhead. <laughs> And I was just standing on the bridge. One was passing like 50 feet above our head. And I like lift up my camera for the shot. And I'm thinking, don't shoot me when I raise this. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so that'll be exciting. The other thing is we met, you mentioned the meter on it, which so far has been very good. But since yeah. it's Chicago in February and March, it's been so cloudy. I finally got to take it out on a really sunny day in downtown. So it's going to be interesting to see how, how the meter was working yeah. mm-hmm. when you had a, a higher dynamic range. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, that makes sense. It's interesting that we all kind of have different uh, like launching off points for transitioning to film. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, because you, I mean, what what made you kind of decide you wanted to start shooting more and more? Well, I realized, first I thought I just want to get more into photography, because I mean, I've always done some photography and I do the video, I've been doing that for years. The video. The, the, the video, the I was going to say the video stuff. I make the video. Yes. I movie. You can tell he's professional, he uses all the, the proper lingo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the video. Uh, and so first I was just wanting to get more into photography of any kind, you know, doing more thought out like portraits with people. Mm-hmm. I just found a random couple and I, I did a whole photo shoot with them. Turned out a couple of randos. Well. <laughs> yeah. A rando couple. And then you guys just were talking about film so much. I thought it <laughs> might I'm, as well. Yeah, might as well. And my mom had all these old cameras. My mom, uh, has taken some gorgeous film for uh, film photographs back in the day. She even cool. kn- knows how to develop film herself and all of that and used to do that. Where's she at, man? I don't know. I, I was Michigan. like, drive down to Brandon's <laughs> apartment to his toddler's room and join us. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. She's not here. Uh, I mean, the studio. What are you talking about? This is a Come super on, large studio. professional studio that we're that's all in, right? Yeah, now. that's not. Yeah, I'm just making up stories. <laughs> but so she uh, she gave me all her old cameras, uh, and it turned out basically none of them worked. <laughs> but then I, I bought this Olympus, uh, and there's currently a Canonette in the shop, which yeah. is why I was defending Ooh. its honor earlier. Oh, which no. one is it? The Canonette? The, what is it, QL, or am I thinking about I'm not that sure. Right? It's it's definitely mm, one of like QL. the, Mark III, the, like the, the old the school ones. One. She, she got it. It was her first camera. She got it in the seventies, I think, and it's still got like the the label maker uh, text oh, on the yeah, back with her cool. with her maiden name and childhood address on wow. it. Wow, that's so, awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's it's got some sentimental value. Yeah, and I'm looking. I haven't been able to shoot with it yet because it's at Central Camera, uh, getting fixed. Uh, hopefully getting fixed. Come on. I called them about it today, and they weren't really aware of where it was or what might be going on. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure so, they'll find it. No, I'm sure they will. They, yeah. they, you know, they're just very analog there. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I've oh, had man. I've had good luck with their repairs there. Um, I mentioned the Kodak Retina that I've got. Um, that camera was like just after World War II is when that one was made, and so. Um, and they did a great job working on that one. It works like it's new. Yeah, and the, so. the, the Canonette didn't need major repairs. It was mostly the foam on the inside for the light proofing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm looking forward to that because I have the Olympus SLR, and then I'll have that, which is a rangefinder, and a fixed lens. And I know Daniel and I have talked frequently about how fixed lenses are just sort of fun because they spur more creativity, you know, that you can't, one, obsess over what focal distance mm-hmm. you should be using. You just have to work with what you got. And often you get used to the distance uh, and you can make some cool stuff with it. Yeah, you know what it looks like before you take the photo. Yeah, before and that's, you even bring the camera up to your eye. Right, that's one thing. I feel like not only are they faster lenses in the sense that the apertures, can they can open up a lot more and let more light in, but also like before you even go to take the photo, I know if I'm too far, like I shoot with a 35 almost exclusively for yeah. for normal day stuff. And I know before I take the photo, before I even bring the camera up to my face, it's like that I can get in the photo, that's going to be out. This is what the composition is going to look like. Yeah. And so it's so much faster for me because it's like, boom, I know what it looks like and before I take it, bring the camera up, snap the photo. Yeah. Um, compared to bringing it up and then toying with a zoom for, you know, 30 seconds yeah. it's not going to take yeah. that long but still it slows you down for some of us it does what yeah. uh, what lens is fixed to yours because i know it's you the know, mark three and they had a couple of versions i think it's the 28 but it might be like a 30 35 35 you did have a I, weird uh i happen to know no uh, yeah, 26 and a half the, or the pentax okay yeah so i believe the mark three is a 40 millimeter 1.9 yes oh yeah, yeah. that is what yeah. it, or is it is it is a 1.7 Oh, shoot, I think it's, it's the one. No, I remember it was, hard, it was hard to remember. It's the best one that they ever made. Doing yeah, video, we, the most we rarely would use like a forty. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that, that's what makes it is. a forty for which cinema. we're getting, which we're getting. Yeah, the right? anamorphic. That's, yeah, I, I feel like we're gonna have we're gonna have a podcast one of these days. We promised it in the first episode, and it's gonna come back around where we talk about like our favorite lenses and favorite lens sets and all of that. Mm. Um, We were going to talk a little bit about that today, but we're kind of pushing that off and like what one of the upcoming topics is going to be, what is the best beginner lens um, both in like cook 40 anamorphic. Yeah. The cook 40 anamorphic. When you first pick up a camera, that should be your first lens. The turret camera. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So that'll be um, an upcoming topic, but uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Awesome. We'll, we'll do a cool. we'll do an episode for beginners about how to attach the cook anamorphic to your wide flex. <laughs> yeah, your, there you go. <laughs> to your instax. The perfect the perfect beginner. There you go. <laughs> Tutorial. So what's your uh, what are you looking to pick up? Did we? Well, it's funny because like this Canonet is sort of the next That's thing I'm it. looking forward to getting mm-hmm. and using mm-hmm. in terms of picking up. Uh, probably additional lenses for the Olympus because right now I've got a 50 1.8 and a 70 to 300 and uh, I haven't seen any pictures from that yet they're they're going into the dark room now so I'm curious to see how that worked out you know I had some questions around it but I would love a good 80 or 85 right Mm -hmm. for portraits nice preach it man yeah I want an 85 for this bad boy really bad but I don't want to put money into it. Yeah. I want to buy an Elon 7 or an EOS 3. And sure. Take, uh, take portraits on your Bronica, bro. I know, man. Yeah. Can... It's it's interesting you say 85 because I'm kind of in Brandon's headspace right now where I've been shooting on, you know, so last year, pretty much the only camera I used was my Fuji X100T. Mm-hmm. So a little bit of math conversion has got a crop sensor, but it has a 23 something millimeter lens. Yeah, so it's yeah. basically like shooting a 35 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. Mm-hmm. So my mental focal length, if you will, mm-hmm. the thing that you kind of see before you bring the camera up to your eye in my last year of shooting has been a 35 millimeter kind of yeah. focal length. So now shooting on the 50 on my Pentax for the last couple months, exclusively mm-hmm. i've kind of shifted back towards seeing things as a 50 millimeter mm, but yeah. um i really want to pick up a 35 for the pentax yeah because they have an f2 and they're really mm-hmm. rel- relatively inexpensive and um i think that'll be fun mm-hmm. yeah I, I love a good nifty 50 but more and more i'm feeling like i would so many things i would like to be shooting either 35 or 85 yeah you know the 50 is versatile because you can you know Mm -hmm. depending on how you frame stuff how close you are you can sort of swing both ways with it right whereas on either one of those other two that's the only type of thing you're going to be shooting right yeah but yeah both of those options i would like to have more range for Mm -hmm. how smart do you know uh what the availability of the olympus lenses are are there lots of them out there on ebay i haven't looked into it a ton but i know like the olympus mount is still common enough Mm -hmm. that you can get stuff yeah Yeah. that's that's awesome yeah, it's um, whenever I shoot 50 millimeter, I I shoot a lot of architectural stuff, and I always feel like 50. I'm a little bit too tight, like just yeah, a little bit. I There's so many that. times when I'm like, oh, I want to capture that whole, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's the, a church facade or something like that, and I go to take the photo with a 50, and I'm like, ah, I can't back up anymore. Yeah. yeah, and it's just too tight. So that's what I like the 35 for. It's a good experiment, though. It's a creative experiment. And yeah. actually, I think. Part- I agree with you because I've done a lot of stuff downtown since getting this this yeah. um, the new camera. But I think part of the stuff you liked in my first role was that okay, I can't get any wider. So how am I going yeah. to crop out part of this building and right. just get like those those neat lines on the side of the building with a background of the lines on the building behind it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Limitations yeah. do produ- produce great creativity. Yeah. 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 I think, yeah. I don't think. I mean, that's something I struggled with this last weekend too. So I wanted to go downtown. The train was going to take forever to get where I was at. And um, I was like, there's so much to shoot around here. I think we get caught up in, oh, we're not in this stellar environment. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And shouldn't just. Yeah. Well, one of the photographers that I, I follow, bring it back to George Muncy. He talks about Mr. how Muncy. he's shot, like, he, it, it, there's something important about going back to where you grew up mm-hmm. and going and photographing there because. Mm-hmm. You're the only, pretty much, you know, people who grew up in a certain town, you're the only people who look at that town with like old eyes. I could go to that yeah. town that Andy grew up in and look at it and be like, that's, oh, that's worth photographing. But you might look over all of those things, you know. You just gave me another idea, man. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But. So bef- before Brandon wraps it up, I wanted to propose something. Hmm. I think I, I brought it, I didn't bring it up to John Henry, but I brought it up to you two that I had a suggestion for a show. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's going to take a little work, but I think it'll be worth it in the end. Uh, we would all write down every film stock we've ever used. Mm-hmm. Right? So we all have a list of film stocks. And then we would kind of be like a secret Santa kind of thing. And one person would get that list. And then you would have to buy a roll for that person of something obscure. Something okay. they haven't, okay. Something okay. they haven't like shot that. on. That's good. Then we take a week and we go and shoot it. Then we talk about it. Talk about it. Uh, our experience. Mm-hmm. 
and at the same time let's have that developed too so we can look right. back and yeah point fingers and make fun of each other <laughs> <laughs> that that's a great idea that is a i good am idea, Andy. actually i'm really excited to to, I think that would to yeah. do something like that. That'd something that the person hasn't shot before. Yeah. Is yeah. there a film stock you haven't shot, Brandon? <laughs> oh, there <laughs> are. That out the no, there oh, are. There's some weird um, ones out there, man. You know, I I am typically fairly basic with my film stocks. I've been branching out more the last year, probably. Um, but there are definitely film stocks that I haven't shot. I mean, I'm picking up some new ones recently, like double film. I mean, yeah. it's it's a little more of a it's on the more extreme end. Special, yeah, specialized mm-hmm. film. Right. It's pre light leaked. Yeah. Um, which is kind of a new, new thing there. Yeah, but, uh, my, but yeah, my no, camera might be pre light leak too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see once we get the film. All sorts of surprises coming when yeah. Andy gets his film back. Yeah, we'll see it. Um, so why don't we make a list tomorrow? Yeah. If, are we all in? Let's do it. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll do it. My yeah. list will be very short. We'll make, make a list. <laughs> a Maybe list we'll just start an, an email chain. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll pick it out. We'll make. What is a ten dollar limit good for film? I mean, it's. Yeah, I would say Unless nothing. It's sinistil. I would I would go fifteen. Fifteen, okay. just because there are some that'll go a little bit over ten. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, even I'm good. I'll a do lot 15. of Fuji stocks, like depending on where you get them, yeah. they can be over ten. So yeah, um, yeah, fifteen dollar so, limit. There yeah, you that's go. Gonna be really fun. Yeah. That that'll be yeah, that's going to be a this. probably a two or three week away show. Yeah. But hey, we'll make it happen. So, yeah, we'll yes. make it. It sounds like a great we'll idea. So let's make it. Let's do it. So. So you want to. All right. So, yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us again. Um, You know, this is we're we're trying to get this to be a more frequent uh, show. So we're we're hoping, you know, once every couple weeks or something like that. But uh, um, yeah. And if you want to send us any emails, whether you want to tell us what camera are you shooting on? um, You know, maybe you've got something obscure or maybe it's something that's fairly generic, but you have unique reasons for wanting to shoot it. It'd be great to hear all of that. Uh, Also, you know, if we made a mistake uh, that you want to correct during the show, none of us are perfect in terms of... Yes, in terms of our uh, the specs that we list or uh, the observations that we make on a camera. So um, all of those emails, whether they're constructive or whether they're affirmative, can be sent to um, podcast at thatvintagelens.com. That's podcast at thatvintagelens.com. Um, and let us know what you're shooting. You know, what, what have you been up to also? Um, we'll try and have a little bit of an update at the beginning of each show of, you know, what have we done this past week? What new things have we tried? Yeah, so thanks again for listening. We're really excited to have you as a listener. So uh, thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon.